guys. Sorry, 16.6 million pounds, whatever the US dollar equivalent was at the time. And it was on a 1998 Volvo estate car. <laughs> well, if you need therapy, if your father's registration plate is GAY777L on a blue Capri. So then you go back and you're still having these discussions about the red leather. So then he's, oh, fuck it. Do the boot in full red leather. To the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number Batsman, raise your bats to the crowd. Episode 50, not out. What an achievement for these, well, let's say weird cricketers. We're all weirdos, but we like being here and talking crap about cars. And there is, I think, no thornier subject in the world of car ownership in the UK than this one. Maybe that's why we waited so long to, to be brave enough to discuss with you. The issue of personalised or private number plates. I'm going to grab my hard hat, go and hide under a rock and leave it to Edward Lovett to tell me what he thinks about private number plates. Well, in the back of my car with a cigarette lighter, <laughs> I grew up with, I grew up in the motor trade and actually some of them weren't private number plates they were just the number plates fitted to those cars and they were that, that were brand when they were brand new that my grandfather was selling nice so for, for me the number plates always had a bit of a story and it whether it's attached to that person or that particular car and a lot of people call their cars by their number plates um, that's how like, yeah. cut, cut seven would be a good example of the yeah. Jaguar racing car. Um, you know, you sort you you don't refer to it as the chassis number; it's cut seven. So I, I I don't have a problem with them like you, Christopher. There's also the humorous side of yes. uh, yeah. uh, of number plates, and I and I told you, growing up as a child, going to the British Grand Prix, there was a Maserati forty two hundred in the BRDC car park there with a very pretty blonde lady that drove it. And her registration number was Love69. Uh, that always made me chuckle. In Notting Hill, there's a BMW IQ, and the, the registration is G6 Pot. But they've obviously moved... No, sorry, G5 Pot. But they've moved the 5 slightly closer to the P, so it's G Spot. <laughs> and it, it's always <laughs> part, it, it's always parked on the same bit of road but it does make you smile when you drive past these things and it does make the, you one smile. Other, the one other thing that I, i'm going to just run through here some highlights of values of these plates not just oh. in the uk but around the world 250 of oh, 25 o sold in the uk to a famous car dealer in the uk for five hundred and twenty thousand pounds um in hong kong someone bought the letter r for 25 million hong kong dollars um in the uae someone bought p7 in dubai for 12 million Pounds. Was that on a Lamborghini Countach or something like that? No, no, no. It was just the registration number. Because you'd have that on a Why P7? Do you know why, why is that important there? Well, it, well it's it, it's actually just shows a seven, but the way the plates are, it's a P over here under Dubai. Yeah, right, right, it, right. Then it's the original right. tire, P7. Yeah. Mm. And, and it's a, and obviously American plates always have a bit of humor because not many people have personalized plates, but people that are real car geeks love to have them and but if if the perfect plate's gone then they start to try and make up some sequence of letters and numbers to do something but you can imagine in manhattan seeing the registration number new york written on a number plate what that would be worth and apparently that has been for sale and in america you can't you can't swap number plates between people so they sort of stay on the car so you'd have to title the car in your name and you can maybe right. move it from one the same owner 
but New York was for sale for sixteen point six million dollars or whatever the uh, U.S. Oh, sorry, sixteen point six million pounds, whatever the U.S. dollar equivalent was at the time, and it was on a nineteen ninety eight Volvo estate car. <laughs> Because you had to, you obviously had to buy the car to get the plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's a little bit of intel on there. I have some private plates. I'm not ashamed of it. And Chris, I've even lent one to you. I know. So you're, you're wrong to say that I have a problem with them. I don't. I, I'm hugely conflicted, and I'll tell you why. And I, I think this will resonate with some of you and some of... Fine. I will screen grab some of your past comments, because you were quite brutally honest uh, on Friday when we were setting these topics. Um, I I think where you grow up and who you grow up with and their so your parents' responses to these things do linger. Yeah, that's good my point. late father was a very Victorian man and he thought these things were a bit ostentatious and he thought a certain type of person wanted to draw attention to themselves yeah. and he didn't like that sort of person. Slightly vulgar. Uh, yes, he would use the V word. Um, and of course, so I, that stuck with me. And, yeah. I, and I and I you know he left my life many many years ago, but I think. I still think of him sitting there looking down at me and I want to want to please him. It's a bit late for that, given some of the things I've done in my life, I think. But um, I think, um, so So when I see them, I, I instinctively want to be my father and go, oh, how vulgar. But actually, some of them I really like. They do make me smile. I'm totally susceptible to the joy of a good number plate. But I, I don't know anything that's more finely balanced than the, than the plate on the car because if it, it's it's never a little bit wrong it's either absolutely right or it's absolutely wrong for me hmm. is this the that, private plate you're talking about I don't, no or, or both types actually yeah. the first the, per, the personalized plate unless it's a piece of genius doesn't really work for me if it's if it says something brilliant then there's a guy called Mark, uh, Mark Riccioni who's a car photographer who has got who has somehow managed to buy an plate that says lasagna on it <laughs> <laughs> and, he's got, and he's and he had it on a Ferrari 360, and it just—I mean, it—it's it's the best number I've yeah. ever seen in a car. It's brilliant. Whenever I, yeah. Mark's a clever guy, and I love that. So that's about the only personalised plate I can deal with. Anyone that needs to try and spell an approximation of their name, anyone that feels the right have the word boss on there, all of that stuff can fuck yeah. off. I can't deal. I just can't deal with it. I don't get it. I'm sorry. I and if you thank you for that, I, it's just with you know, I just don't really get it. But, you know, there are plates I think do look really good on cars. Uh, and I, I I have, for my sins, got one on my car, but that's for a slightly different reason. Uh, and I think I, I, I'm not universally against them at all. I just think I think it's one of the things that's get, getting it right is so difficult. Maybe yeah. I'm scared that I won't get it right. Therefore, I'd rather just leave it well alone and have a normal number plate on it. But maybe you guys are braver than me. Um, so, Neil Clifford, you've got a few of these things. What are your thoughts? I'm very conscious that it's very evidently quite narcissistic, whatever that word. You just say, it, yeah, that <laughs> word is um, when you when you you know you'd eat yourself if you could type person. I think that there 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 is quite a lot attached to it, isn't there? If you get it wrong, you're really way off the mark. You look a quite a tit. I think I think that's true, but I get joy from them not just that i've got a few and I, or or i study the type of plate not about money really it's the joy of buying that 199 quid plate off of regtransfers.co.uk because you want an ageless plate for an old car and you want it just to you know that mercedes 6.3 estate one of one that i bought off collecting cars i just i wanted uh, an age-related plate. It's on an H, and but I want I just wanted the number sixty-three on it because it's debadged. So the six point three badge is not there. The original owner, McAlpine, took the badge off because it's he didn't want to show off to his fellow workers that it was a six point three. So and I wanted the little nudge to a six point three without having to put the badge back on. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> as as some of you know. Even when there's an original plate, I go back and find the original dealer, the Audi that was bought in the Glasgow dealership in 1993, and I've got an amazing chap who makes me that plate with the original font and the original 1993 phone number in Glasgow with mm. the original logo that you can find it on Google. I do that weird shit. So for me, it's not about just owning 
a, a crazy expensive thing or a flash thing. I certainly don't do the name and all that malarkey. I just think it's another thing you can think about for hours, and which I find fascinating. It right? brings joy. Then do brings it. Joy. It yeah. brings Man, joy. It brings joy. what do you think about these things? The, the last thing I say is all you know, all those plumbers with flush and bog and all that. I love all that. It gives me yeah. joy. There's a there's a there's a mobile toilet place about a mile from my house. I leave my house at five in the morning to go to work, and this guy in his lorry full of bogs leaves at the same time, and his number plate is shit bog, and I. <laughs> Every single morning, it can't literally be shit bog. What does it mean? Like... Made it into shit bog. Oh, it's, 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 I could see. <laughs> we, we, we had a Dick Lovett customer with pig shit and bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Every single <laughs> it makes me laugh, and yeah. anything that makes you laugh, laughter is just one of the best sod taking antidepressants. Just fucking laugh more. Yeah, yeah, here, yeah. here. Manish, what do you think about these things? Maybe the greatest thing about this podcast is you can change your mind. And I just have in the yeah. last three minutes. I've gone from baseball bat wielding you know, to kind of like more. I mean, Edward has explained that basically get the right number plate and it's, it's your Bitcoin, isn't it? You bought it for whatever and it's now worth whatever. I know my, my sister's registration plate, she is a GP, a sick doctor. I don't know how she did it, but it is actually, it makes me laugh. It's, Every t- it's, it's great. Sick doctor. Um, I didn't a registration plate, I think 888 is owned by somebody from Hong Kong. Didn't that? That will be, a, that's, yeah. Very sick, doc- nice. sick, sick doctor is uh, S15KDR. Um, Something like that. I mean, it is actually just, just hilarious. Listen, I... It makes you laugh if you're obsessed. Neil, I can't believe that you've managed to find someone who can find the exact font. No, I find the font. I oh, do. That's, the, even, uh, that's insane. Makes, I, it gives me something else to do. So I can find the font. I can find the phone number. I can find the dealership, the address, everything. It, this um, retro, retro plate oh. on Instagram is amazing and it make anything for you. Yeah. Okay, I just do that. So I can obviously, it's not to drive on the road, they're show plates. Don't drive them on the road. Sorry, I was going to. I got the slight reverse relationship to Chris there because Chris is trying to kind of, in some Freudian way, please his father by disapproving of these things. I had Robert. My dad had a Mercedes, and it's registered because California. You can, if they don't exist, you can get them made up. Yeah. So his his Mercedes had the really unegotistical plate of Pande, <laughs> and it just. California, P-A-N-D-E-Y. I've got a photo of that. I will share it with you guys later. And my um, my stepmother, who had the BM, BMW, the green 535 I was telling you about, she came from a place in India called Kurg, and he got her the registration plate, Kurg, C-O-O-R-G. And that's the thing about that country. If it doesn't exist, you can actually apply for it, and they'll make it up. Yes, nice. it's 75 bucks or something like yeah, that. Some, yeah, some ridiculously small numbers. Don't you like seeing really shitty old cars with a monstrously cool number plate? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm told it's an inheritance tax wheeze, but don't tell anyone. What? Keeping the number plate on the car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't... Ah. Then, yeah, you've got to be careful with that. Just if the car fails to get an MOT or something or gets written off, then you've got problems. Then you lose it. Yeah, um, I, saw, I saw today December DEC twenty six on a Fiat five hundred. You know that's got to be, got to be a thirty grand plate, isn't it, on a two grand car? I'll, I'll give you two grand for it. And I, I think within <laughs> the, there is a, there is definitely some some consistency there. People that have got incredible collections of cars do tend to put the most valuable number plate on the most unlikely car, and I do like that. You know, if you've got, I remember. Ford Motor Company UK have one car. That's quite a valuable number. That's a good yeah. car. That's good. And sometimes it would suddenly appear on a Ford Calf or something as a press car out of nowhere. You'd be <laughs> given this thing to drive and you think everyone knows the number plate is worth 30 times the value of the car. Yeah. So I didn't quite like that. Chris Cooper, number plates. When I was a wee bairn and my brother and I were into dinghy racing, 
when we were little. I remember being driven by, so it must have been 15, 16. We were driving up the A74 in southern Scotland, Scotland mm -hmm. to towards the Largs, which is on the Firth of Clyde, a uh, very big sailing place, to go in some dinghy world championships when we were 15, 16. And we were being t we were in my father's Granada Mark II, two litre L, which we were quite pleased with at the time. And then whizzing past us went, it would have been an early 930 red 911 turbo. Nice. With the number plate TUR80. Oh. And to me, and it, it was when you could get away with no spaces, it just said turbo. The end. That's Brilliant. cool. Yeah. The end. It's just, um, so I totally get that, you know, I mean, how much would that be now? So, Eduardo, how much would that be now, TUR80? 100 grand, 150 grand. It must be more than that, surely. Anyway, no, no, yeah, 100, 75 to 100. I'm really good at guessing these prices. We should okay. have a competition on prices. Okay, so <laughs> if if by some bizarre chance the person who owns currently TURA0, then do let us know what, what consideration you might be interested in in the marketplace. Um, the the, uh, the value is obviously quite specific. Numbers numbers after are worth more than numbers before. And yeah, but when they make a word, I mean, there's only one turbo, yeah. isn't there? So yeah, but the, the, low, the only... lowest a obviously single digit and yeah, yeah. Number, yeah. Um, there used to be, uh, I'm sure some of you've seen this to be and not to be. Yeah, that's still parked on the embankment. Yeah, on the embankment. I thought it was on the embankment. It was... Range Rover and a and a Vanquish. Yeah, Ray and an Aston. Yeah, and when I used to drive in, when I worked in the had offices in London, you drive in down the A4, go yeah. down to the embankment, all the way just on the left, yeah, just before one of the bridges. Uh, That's a brilliant Aston. combination. That's really clever, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but the most important thing, I mean, so I'm I'm a bit like Monkey. Actually, I'm a sort of. I do have, one. Um, I don't like on the current structure of number plates. I don't like the september version of the plates 71 72 didar they just look wrong the first of march ones eight nine ten that's fine aesthetically it looks fine the big numbers <laughs> look like q plates to me oh don't talk about q plates no i know we'll do that some other time <laughs> uh because that'll just go wrong um <laughs> so i my sausage has got a personalized number plate on it largely because i didn't want it to have a 71 on it oh it. that's why but my the most the most emotional thing for me is my dad's number plates yep 860 glk where is it god knows it's a daimler 250 it was in the 70s early 70s he had a daimler 250 which have he bought for 80... hmm? have you searched have, it? no it's a good question i might i'll do it afterwards uh 860 glk uh, his first proper company car was a Ford Consul in Fern Green, Ford Consul Estate, TKN 281N. Then he had a first of the Mark II Granadas, WKJ 849S. Then he had a Granada gear, 2.8 carburetor, not an eye, smaller oh. wheels, 2.8 Granada in, I think, Bahama Gold, I think, with chocolate. Good man. Uh, GKN77V. Then he had a Rover SD1, RKM 113W, then a facelift SD1, which was JDD, JDD, that's really your name or something. No, uh, sorry, this A297 really JDD. A this really has JDD. become therapy. I love it. This is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. A297 JDD. And then that was his last company car before he retired. He was quite young, or he was an older father. But those. I can't remember almost any of the number plates I've had because you know we've had, we all have had more cars than our parents did, but those are the numbers. I can yeah, see I agree them. with that. Yeah, I, I can see them, yeah. and I'll never forget them. The so number plate, the number plate that I have on my um, Tuttle car is the well, that that I had that it, my father bought it for me. I think before, I must have been just after I was born, and he had it on my grandmother's car, so it was on my grandmother's car for. 
until I was 17. And then it went on to my first car, my Nissan Sunny 1.4 LX. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, tw- 25 years later or whatever, it's uh, it's still on my cars. Why well, is the year you need wrong? therapy if your father's registration plate is G-A-Y 777L on a blue Capri. I grew up in that. <laughs> 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 That really when you grew really, up really, in that, yeah. it, especially when your dad's been married four times and basically his hobby was shagging all the this nurses is, this is of his marriages. This and is he, why they're so good. Absolutely number plate. registration plate. I mean, for yeah. God's sake. If did. anyone has CUN7, let me know. I'll buy that and I might lend it to a few people I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Dear me. All right. Okay, let's move on. Where are we? Next subject. Are we going to cut one of these off, or what do you think? How? how... Yeah, let's cut, let's cut off. Um, we're going to cut off the 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 one after this. We're not going to do Japanese thing on a Japanese car. That's good because I was going to embarrass myself. Okay, so we're going to do silliest boots. I'm yep. going for, and I'm going first because I suspect someone else is going to do this one. But it still annoys me that the Ferrari SF90 doesn't have a boot. I don't, and I, and I, do you know what? The, I don't think the car has been a, a massive sell success. I don't think it's a residual success now. And it, for all its cleverness, it deserves not to be a success if it doesn't meet the basic requirements of being a motor vehicle. That is to be able to take the luggage or carry the luggage of the two people that are sitting in it to go on that journey. I just don't understand why you'd invent, it's like inventing a car with missing a wheel or a gearbox. It's quite mm-hmm. an important thing for me. And I think, and I think, as Neil Clifford, a man who might have been on the list to buy one of those cars that didn't, might feel quite smug because he he did the right thing in not buying that car. It doesn't. Yeah. Have, it, it has no usable luggage space. You can't go on adventures on it. And a car that can't be used for adventures is no longer a car. There's no car around. Yeah. Uh, I had SF90 written down and put, and I've said there surely wins. However, it doesn't even have a boot, so I'm not sure you can refer to it as a boot at all. Yeah. I, I remember selling. Um, Maserati Quattroportes knew back in the day that um, obviously some people asked, like, could I could I have a look at the boot, please? <laughs> can, can I see if the boot? And obviously you're selling them a large four-door saloon and they're currently driving an S-Class and thinking they might fancy something Italian and exotic. Well, yes, it's got a boot. It's got a boot. But it had a, I'm not sure if you'd even remember, but for a large four-door saloon, you'd barely fit a single set of golf clubs in there uh it was totally sounds like a good thing yeah. well, I, I have to give a special mention to my polestar one which because it has a lovely display case for the flux capacitor cables and all the special electronics in the back there really doesn't have a boot i mean i, I can't get one set of golf clubs in it i have to take the driver out and it weighs 2.3 tons <laughs> and, and the other one is the b whatever it is b3 audi AT90. The, the one that was shaped like a bar of soap. My father yeah. had two of these because they, it, it had a transverse, no, it had a longitudinal 500 engine that hung out in the front, but so, so it could have loads of rear legroom. But they decided that they wouldn't really fit it with a boot for reasons of styling. And then the Quattro one had a diff underneath the boot floor. So what you were left with, I mean, you, you, you yeah, it was nothing. We, I remember trying to go up, I remember trying to go up to Heathrow Airport as a kid, and I'd had a suitcase on my lap always because it wouldn't go in the fucking boot. Um, uh, who else has strong I, feet? I, I tell you, you say that, and the, the the thing about the Quattroporte, I know this is podcast of the people territory. Bentley Mulzahn, the first time you open the boot of one of those, you think, where's the rest of it? Well, in, in that case, there are a full size spare. There's a and there's also a, um, a two umbrellas, and and in between the seats, you've got the fridge to hold the champagne flutes. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of practical and stuff. There's, and there's, big, there's a big fuel tank because, but my, I think um, the Austin Allegro doesn't get the award for the worst boot because the rest of the car is so shit. It's still trailing the rest of the car <laughs> under worst award criteria. If they were bad. <laughs> uh, mini convertible. Does the mini, the original, sorry, the original, well, the BMW mini convertible had that boot lid. It, it, that, Rather than do it, you had to it lifted up like that. Yes. Rather yes. than being like the original Issy Gones one like that, which had a little like picnic yeah. tank. It it did that. And you think you can't 
you've got to be a midget person to be able to get down there to put your hands and knees. But I think the prize goes to F type convertible. The <laughs> only <laughs> thing you can fit in that effectively is plasticine. <laughs> And you'd come out with a perfect mould of the worst boot ever. I mean, what the frigging frig were they thought about when they... I mean, the, the thing weighs more than Mars. It's such a heavy car. I like them. I think it's really... With the V8, the SVR... Is charge. Yeah. ...on Silly. Yeah. And the run-out 450, which is a super... It's a lightly supercharged 5-litre V8. A bit more tasteful. But the boot, literally... You could put plasticine or marshmallows in it, but you get no. That is useless. Really ran out of ideas. <laughs> um, uh, Neil Clifford, you probably own the vehicle that you think has got the silliest boot. I've got a funny feeling it's one of your own cars. Well, see the the question, the specific question is silliest boot, not worst boot. Yes, mm. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And and uh, if I don't answer this honestly, a lot of my friends will say you you should have said what you really felt. So I've 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 a, I have to approach these things with due honesty. I I I went to um a lovely place in Italy called um Marinello to order a lovely car. And my strategy was to to do lovely posy blue because that's my car, my color. I love that color. It's very sort of understated and no one obviously knows it's a car from that brand because it's blue. Um, but I wanted to do red leather. I had this obsession with red leather. And when I got there and we had the discussion and even whilst b- before you've had the glass of champagne and you know they get you very drunk so you order loads of shit you don't need, I'm like, actually, this is not going to work. Red leather is going to be too much on this car. I've got to, It's going to be a mistake. I'm going to have to really tone it down. I want the blue. And therefore, we didn't do any any red leather. But at that point, um, one has had a couple of glasses of champagne and you're going off to the, you know, the the pasta place over the road and having a lovely lunch with the man. And the Matthew has come with you, actually. So Matthew Beard is there making sure you've drunk about four bottles of champagne at this point. So then you go back and you're still having these discussions about the red leather. So then he's, oh, fuck it. Do the boot in full red leather. <laughs> so I, I actually have a car that's posy blue with a dark, I think it's an Alcantara and, you know, very chic inside. But when you open the boot, the boot is fully lined in red leather. It's one of the stupidest things I've ever done. And therefore, <laughs> to me, it has to be the silliest boot of a car. That, I've <laughs> that is, that, it's a good distinction between just simply crap and worst. Yes. And not worst, yeah. Silly. It's still a yeah. better boot than an SF90 because it's a boot. It's, it's a boot. boot. Yeah, yeah, it, but it's silly. Under the heading of silly leather linings to one end of the vehicle, am I recalling correctly that Singer would sell you a car with leather? They have, they have. A That's leather. how they come as standard quilted leather engine bay. And leather. Leather, a leather engine bay. Yep. They don't I mean, get a fire am either. I missing something? I yeah, know it's cool. Yeah, you are. You need to get a Singer. They're bloody great. Yeah, also, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. also leather has quite good sound deadening quality, so it actually works quite well. Doesn't someone sort of... someone sold one on here just before they really rocketed in price. Oh, did they? Who was that? Oh, stop it! Talk yeah. about talk about something else. He doesn't call it. He just, he, he just refers to the car as Monaco. Yes, I was driving uh, Monaco. I'm like, yeah, how, yeah. yeah. I was thinking, yeah. How do you and drive a Prince of Monaco? I even got wheels. The same pun. I always think to myself, how did he drive a Principality? It's not even got wheels. Right, you couldn't you couldn't get Monaco, but I so I got M O N four C O. Is that right, Monaco? Yeah, yeah, yeah M O N four C O. That's good. Um, okay, Manish. Um, well, silliest, silliest boot. I reckon it's going to be seventies and wedge shaped. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just actually got got two silly boots. One unapproachable, the other one unaffordable. I uh, the unaffordable. It's a Mura boot. You can get a credit card in there. That's it. It just mm. flips up, and there's that little thing. And that's it. Literally, You're not even an umbrella. Like that. Just at a practical level, practical level. I was looking two years ago for a BMW 5 Series Touring, and I looked at the electric one. 
And as you know, I have the Audi A4 app on. It needs to be able to, the reason why I wanted to get an estate is because the dog needs to go in the back and cricket bags and all the rest of it. And its boot or its cargo area is smaller Raised than right the because yeah. of the battery. It's got a yeah. 70 kilo battery. So basically, it just literally, it's a, it's a butt. I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. Very silly. It was very silly, and I wouldn't buy it for that exact reason. You can't, you can't get a bigger car with much less storage capacity. That makes no sense. And if you don't drive it a lot, I'd basically be lugging a 79 kilo battery everywhere yeah. I go. Alice. Yeah. I'm, I'm just so, going to have to go and put my children to bed. I will be back momentarily. Yes. Like okay. As the Americans so say. his commitment to the cause. Edward's still here, despite the fact that he's got to put nippers to bed. So we're going to move on to, in his absence, what car maker has your favourite oh. naming strategy? This is a thorny issue. This could go on for some time. I'm going to move to Neil Clifford, and uh, I'm, I'm going to say you're limited to 24 minutes. Well, I, I think they have to be words, not numbers. What? Ooh, there you where go. Where does it say that? Where does whoa, it say that? Whoa, no. whoa, whoa. Because, Shut you know, up. even though we love... Put the, the brakes on, Bobby. And the five series and oh. seven series or the mercedes s i don't like the initials or the germans do it badly that's the first thing i want to say because it's oh all about god they're all who has taken who, neil clifford can we have the they're all back? logical there's can no we have neil back? can we have they're neil all, back they're all left brain logicy people I think you need the right bra brain, creative people that sit there for hours smoking gear. What amazing emotional word can we find? So on the basis that you're either as a numbers and letters logical person or you're a words and emotion and right brain person, I'm on that side. And therefore Why can't you be both? Well, because it's sort of impossible or your name's Steve Jobs and, you know, you can... No one wants that, yeah. Yeah. Or, or can I pose the Neil? Can I pose the question? Yes. Is it possible if you're a genius to to find to be able to create that emotional response, but in a number? I don't think that's very easy. Well, let's but, find but out. But when you see, but when you see two fifty, what do you think? Well, I think well, about well, two seventy five. Ferrari do do it both because they mainly use words. They two seventy five. I think yeah. Ferrari mainly uses numbers. Yeah. No, no. Teaching the two seven five Ferrari, Rossa, um, Enzo, La Ferrari. They're much more emotional than the numbersy logical stuff. Yeah, not, anyway, so not that ugly two seven five then. No, well, no, because I've sold it. If you write, and if you write, and if you write, if you write two fifty GTO on, on paper, I mean, it's, it's quite. It's no, got but, a about it. No, can I just give my fucking answer? Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so in that logic, I would go. I would either go Bentley. I would go Rolls Royce. I think those lovely emotional silver shadow, Camargue, Corniche. They, they, they typify all these beautiful places or emotional situations. Yeah. So that's where I am. I'm words, not numbers, because I'm right brain, not left brain. So, Edward Lovett, what's your favourite naming strategy for a car brand? I found this difficult because I'm not sure what I find. It, it and it's clearly become quite challenging for uh, these manufacturers to do it. I I think Ferrari have always done a pretty good jo job uh, with theirs until they got to Pura Sangue and they've clearly fucked it all up now because that's just a ridiculous name. Yeah. Um, but and then so <laughs> BMW obviously always used to just follow engines and it was the actual size of those engines and then they lost the plot and started naming them things that actually didn't relate to the size of the engine yeah. so that, yeah. that made it very difficult and then I, I I went back to look at AC because you know I like a Cobra but AC's first car was the AC light car and then they did an AC6 and then an AC Ace and then an AC Ace Bristol and then they did things like an AC Le Mans and an AC Targa Floria so it's sort of named after what it did um, and Bentley, it was a Bentley three liter and a four and a half liter and a blower. So it sort of just said what it did on the tin. I quite like that. It's obviously far more challenging now to be able to do that. Um, and it, was it 
Peugeot that own the rights to having an O in the yeah. middle of their, yeah. of their names. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I think they challenged Porsche on it, didn't they? That's why the 901. It would have been the 901. Yeah, yeah Porsche had to change their naming strategy uh, to not have an O uh, or a zero in, the, in between it. So what was the favourite? Uh, I don't have a favourite. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Manish? Fine. I think... I've never been in the Neil camp harder. I think it's all about words. And I think there are two car companies for a small period of time that named their cars more beautifully than they reach anyone else. The first one was Lamborghini in naming them after bulls or bull-like areas. So Mura, Espada, Islero, Harama, Uraco. And Uraco is a little bull. So I think it's beautiful. But I think one company has done it even better and it's Maserati naming them after exotic winds. After flat oh, I think wind, mm. erotic. Wind, <laughs> exotic wind, no. <laughs> erotic wind, no. Exotic wind, so Mistral, Ghibli, Kamsin, Merak, Bora. What's the I mean, these are just beautiful names. And the wind. Meteor what yeah. meteorological phenomena is Ghibli? It's, um, th yeah. that's in, um, believe it or not, I think that's an English patient the Ghibli, and it's a, it's a desert wind, the Ghibli. Okay. And uh, so, and there, there was just one little thing that the four seaters, they named them after circuits. And I think they picked rather beautiful Sebring, Mexico, Indy, and Kailami. Lovely. Which, uh, which circuit is Quattroporte? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <Just that. laughs> it's a corner. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's hard to disagree with that. I, and also, as a language, oh. they, they, Quattroporte just sounds wonderful. You know, if I if yes. we if I launched the Ford four door, people wouldn't think it was that sexy. So I I think it yeah I I can I can buy into that right, Chris Cooper. I mean, at one level, there is literally only one winner of this. Oh God, <laughs> Skoda. Oh, okay. Let's go. The Skoda abominable snowman. The Yeti. The Yeti. That's lovely. Kodiak. Big yeah. scary bear. Roar. It's not my favourite. I actually think I'm going to leave, I'm going to let Monkey have a go at BMW. The reason why I like BMW is because I, three series, five series, so you just knew until quite recently what you're going to get. But actually, I think, and actually, I'm with you on this one, Neil, because we're a broad church. And I think you're right with Rolls Royce. Merlin. It's emotional. Merlin, mm. Avon, Trent, Pegasus, Viper, Olympus. Lovely engines. Silver Mist. Which Those was, are all which obviously it was never sold in the silver market because that means silver shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Rolls Royce, whether it's cars or, or aero engines, a lot of them obviously English or British rivers, Trent, Spey. Tyne, no. but Merlin, Pegasus, Viper, Olympus. It's a winner. That's my okay. favorite. I can buy into that, but you know where I'm going with this. So I am completely the opposite. For me, it's all about the late 70s, the whole of the 80s, and the early 90s in a country called Germany. And it's yep. two car manufacturers. It's Mercedes-Benz yep. and BMW. Yep. Somehow managed to, to make some of my age literally fall about on the road like I'd seen the second coming because there was a number that was slightly different to another number on the back of a car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first time from the rear, I saw a 750i on the road and I thought I hadn't seen the, I hadn't seen the squared exhaust pipes. I just saw 750 rather than 735. And the fact that someone had added 15 to someone who is totally dysnumeric and it sent me wild was everything. And I love the way that BMW, particularly BMW for me, that just if you saw this badge, you'd go, oh my God, 5.3? I thought it was a 5.25. It's a 5.28. Five, five, it's a 5.35. Yeah. It's yeah. A 5.40. Yeah. And, it, it's, and I think Mercedes-Benz as well. I used to, and I, There was something about the Mercedes-Benz name that was even more conservative. So when you did see something different, like when you saw your first 500e, it was like, oh yeah. my god, yeah. 
yeah. this is a spaceship. And of course, well, the first time we had the long badged when they did this 24 valve engine, the inline six, and the coupe was badged 300 CE 24. That ruined it for me because yeah. it didn't fit the strategy. No, that was trying too hard. It stepped outside of the logic for me. Trying too hard. Yeah. But, I, and but I just, I loved it. And I think also the idea that so much of, we discussed the rear headrests in cars, the, the aspirational points. For me, there was so much aspiration attached to these back to these to these numbers on the back of yeah. cars. They, they meant so much. And that I, w that the W one two three, the wagon, because most of them were a two two hundred or two thirty or two thirty T E. Yeah. yeah. But then once in a blue moon. And you saw two eighty. Oh, yeah, no, how oh, tingly! Cool. How tingly did that make you feel? And I, 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 even though it's a shame, it's shameful to admit that you'd go there. You'd think, what's the rest of their life like? Yeah. Where do they go on holiday? <laughs> yeah. What do they, they must smell different. You know, these these pe these people must be spectacular. They might have two televisions in their home. And this is based on on someone adding three digits or three numbers to one weird number. isn't it I, mean, I just don't understand yeah. how they made it work yeah, i'm and, totally with you on that and bmw back in the back in the 80s when i used to go to western counties which then became part of the dick lovett empire um uh that you'd get the brochures and the three each brochure for three five and seven would just list the models on the front and it would go 318 oh. 320 and then three two three i and I and they'd be the, the the badges were perfectly lit with little sparkles that would come off where the lighting in the studio. They just they built my dreams. So I'm afraid I love I like a six twelve Scaglietti and I like it, but you can they can all go hang. I, I, and I love Giulietta, Julia. I love all those names, but there's something about German defined numbers that just totally captivated me. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm yeah. sad. I know I'm sad, but I, but I, I can't help it. It's, yeah, I, I'm totally, I love it. Right, here we go. You have bought or built your dream house and have negotiated a space for one automotive or motorsport component or artifact. The budget, much like the two-car garage from last week, that wasn't acknowledged by every addict, is limitless. What do you choose? Chris Cooper, let me just repeat that for you. The budget <laughs> is limitless. Do you think I didn't spot that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, thing, that one thing, Christopher. One thing. Uh, I've, got, I've got one answer. I've got Go one on. answer. Go on. So I talked about it with the boys, and they said a great idea would be to get the Ferrari Pratt perch from the Formula One pit wall and have that converted into a bar. So where all the screens are, you'd have like hand pumps for stuff. Um, but that's not my answer. And I then <laughs> thought about, I then thought about, um, I quite like spa, the circuit. But that's not my answer either. Oh, you can fit that in the backyard. It just says one, you have spent, you've negotiated space for one automotive motorsport component or artifact. The budget is limitless. Mm. I don't know what constrains your thinking, Edward. I read. You've already given us two answers. Carry on. <laughs> uh, then I thought I'm going to have the Ferrari factory. <laughs> the, whole, the whole fucking thing. <laughs> but you know that's not the answer either. I'm, I'm going to have. It. I'm going to have Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have Italy. Because it's got the Ferrari factory, it's got yep. the Zonda factory, it's got those God's own roads, it's got friendly policemen, it's got the food of yep. the yep. pub. So you, got the to, one, you can have a little so drive on your roof in the evening. On it's a, a limitless country. budget, the one automotive yeah. and motorsport <laughs> artifact I'm going to have is Italy. <laughs> um, unbeatable. Neil Clifford beat that. It, no, it's pretty unbeatable. But <laughs> in last week's podcast, <laughs> what a week it's been! Oh, we, yeah, it's actually it feels. What have, feels you done this, what, is, what have you done this week since the last it, podcast? It feels like yesterday. <laughs> the, um, we talked about passengers, and and 
the best and most legendary passenger of all time was a guy called Dennis Jenkinson, who yeah. did the Milli Milia with Sterling Moss. He wants the rolling thing. Bog roll. In 1955, and did it in, you know, 100 miles an hour, 10 hours, 1,000 miles. And they did it. A lot of the reason they did it is because Dennis built a cassette machine that held their pace notes and it whirled around and he sat there for 10 hours putting sweets which was my only job for my wife putting sweets into sterling moss's mouth if you read all the, the yeah. that big beautiful um uh article that he wrote about doing the whole thing and he had no fear because he was a he was um he, he raced sidecars right dennis so he's got bull yeah, yeah, he's a professional sidecar guy. He a passenger or the rider? I th I think he was a passenger because he was about he was, a passenger. One, he was about one foot tall, yeah, and if you look at all the photographs. But so he's got balls of steel, and he made this amazing machine that meant that they knew exactly where they were going the whole time. And I would I would just I don't you know whatever this thing costs, I probably was sold at auction twenty years ago for like fifteen hundred quid. Um, I'd, I'd have that. That's my favorite thing. In That's the a world. very cool thing. Neil, do you know who Jenks' favourite driver was of all time? I should, but I don't. Neither Senna. Either. It was Senna. Mm. Was it? Mm. I mean, he lived down in Winchester with, with no no electricity or water, yes. did he? He lived like Stig of the Dump. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That weasel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Edward Lovett. I don't have one answer, but I've got a few things here. Chris, no, you can only got, have one answer. Chris is obviously well. I've got, I know I've got one answer. Yes, a bit like you. <laughs> anyway, your yours was brilliant. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so congratulations <laughs> over there. Well done. I think <laughs> I think I would love one of those sort of plastic Ferrari. Estorossa bed frames, so my I could see my son at four years old sleep in one of them. I never had one of those beds. Oh, I think, I think I'd so quite like to put him to bed in one of those. So Whilst uh, he doesn't look at me like, what the fuck is this? You made me sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if I'm not if I'm not careful, it'll be too late, and I won't be able to do it. I I, I went to uh, Sir, Ten Sir Terence Conran's house about 15 years ago uh, near Hungerford. And I'll find a picture of this and put there. They, they've recently all been sold. He passed uh, away yeah. Yeah. two years ago. Um, but he had the beautiful blue children's pedal Bugattis on, on, his, uh, on the hallway of his house. He had about eight or ten of them lined up. And uh, as you walked into the house, this hallway, it was just so it was just creative and it looked brilliant. He's a stylish dude. He is a super stylish dude. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I, I have seen Formula One cars on the on the walls and ceilings of people's houses. And that's always quite an impressive thing in an atrium or a living room or a man's cave. But I just think I sort of wrote that down. But actually, I just don't think it's interesting, uh, interesting enough. But maybe, which I believe this car lives, or it used to live when I saw it, it underneath our favourite Porsche dealer in Stard in the minus five in their secret storage there, which was Ferrari chassis number 001, effectively. Right. I think, I think that would be, and it's a tiny little... Oh, he's gone. Oh, he's he's coming, he'll, he'll be back. Be back. I'm going to yeah. get a photo of that for posterity. <laughs> oh. There he's go. oh, he's back. Are you there? No, we lost, you. Free. We, lost you. we lost you there, but we've got a photo, we've got a cracker of your forehead. Yeah. Right, carry on. No, fine. I'm not sure where you lost me, but uh, the original... 001, no. chassis. Yeah, that, that that would be nice. And then clearly, if I ever wanted to use Italy, I'd just pop around to my mate's house and uh, play around. <laughs> You're always backyard. welcome. You're yeah. always welcome. Um, so uh Manage, what are you gonna have? My dream drawing room would have a fantastic piano in it, not because I can play. Because my son can, next to massive windows looking over the, the beautiful greenery of uh, Belsnice Park. And just next to it, I'd have a single, I hate overhead lights, except for this. I'd have a single overhead spotlight 
makes a tiny cone approximately 18 inches wide and sort of chest high, there'd be a, an absolutely black plinth and on it would be Senna's 1985 bell helmet from winning his first Grand Prix, the Portuguese Grand Prix. Yep. Bell yep. helmet. So it's John Player Special on it. It's got the Renault blue thingy, Nacional, and just the little bell. And that's all. And that would be the most, I've seen it. It does exist. It's, it's in the um, museum or the family's uh, sort of special shrine to him, really, in Sao Paulo. And it is just the yellow. It's mm. beautiful. So it's almost like a limey yellow. Um, it really contrasted so beautifully with that car. It is just the most iconic thing for me in motor racing ever. Well, it's yours, Manish. There you go. The best thing is all of these things are yeah. given to us now. Yeah. And it, but it's been a struggle buying Chris Cooper Italy, but we've managed to negotiate a deal. Um, so I would say um, we discussed it a couple of weeks ago. There, there is a I have a racing car with my name on it in the Porsche Museum. I'd quite like I'd quite like to to have that. But actually, it's just if if you invite the few people that you still like or that like you into your house or converted barn or stately home or flat. And the first thing they see is a picture. Of, the first thing they see is a racing car with your name on the side of it. It's a bit, it's a bit cockish, isn't it? I mean, you can't really get away with that. So there's one thing I've, that I've always viewed on a racing circuit that has always made me feel good, and it's a tiny little sign on a long racing circuit in Germany, and it's it's a marker board on the outside of the last court, real corner at the Nordschleife. Yeah, and it signifies two things. It signifies this is the longest circuit you'll ever drive, and it signifies well three things. It signifies you need to turn in now. If you don't turn in now, you're going to be on the wrong line. And it also signifies you've just completed another lap and you're not dead. And the, the number on it is one eight six. And when that you reach cost. one eight, when you reach one eight six at the Nurburgring, you have to turn in. If you if you don't turn in before one eight six, you will enter the Dottinger the the long straight at the end. You'll enter it in the wrong place and crash. So what I want that 186 board. And I don't care where it goes in my house. It could be somewhere significant. It could just sit in the kitchen. It could just sit somewhere. As long as I can see it, it's a bit like it's like the half of a of a fire for me. It just just there. There's something comforting yeah. about one eight. If you ever gone there, the 186 board is the most special moment sport board. And it's about that big. It's not very big at all. And it's what right is the one eight? What is the one eight six? It's well. There's a mark. There are, the Nur, the Nordschleife is punctuated by these marker boards, and they're numbered, and they obviously go up when they're running around. And some of them, when you learn it, some of them are obvious on your sight line. That's the turning point, or they're the turning point. But you're looking over there, and the things there. One eight six is as you come out of the Kleiner carousel, the little carousel, and you sort of wind up to it. The road rises a bit. It's a double apex right hander, and you look at that sign, and you think. That's the most evocative description of that circuit I've ever heard. You are so, I trade Italy for that. <laughs> but one eight, honestly, when you go, if you've raced there a lot, one eight six just says totally. Well, another one under my belt didn't hurt myself, and I'll I'll take one eight six. And it's yeah. a really satisfying because if you get that right, oh, and, you, and you make the apex, <clears> and you you can feel it, you can feel where I take in the car we used to race fifth gear. And then you just, and then you get towards the gantry where the big Audi sign is. You you know you've got it right, and you you know when you saw that sign back there. I think that's really. Oh, I love I'll, I'll have one eight six. In fact, I might make a fake one eight six. I don't know. Am I allowed to make a fake? Let's one go and nick it. Yes. Go nick it. We can't go and nick it because it's part. Of the, I can't do that. You get a personal number plate with one eight six written on it, <laughs> <laughs> like we talked about last week. Yeah, <laughs> that seems so long ago. <laughs> There's a touch of the imp about you, Neil Clifford. I like that jumper. You weren't wearing that an hour ago. Your man no. could knock could <laughs> knock that up for Chris. He could okay. knock that up for Chris. Yeah. We're going for we're going for our two car garage. Okay. Oh. Yeah. This is sent in by Max Jelly. Is that a real name, Max Jelly? It's Stephen um, Jelly, isn't that we've raced yeah. with? Okay. It's 1995, and you're a successful American banker living a double life in Tokyo. By day, you need a car to be driven in that will impress both your clients and the general public. But be careful. 
This is the heyday of the, the, of the Yakuza, and a large black limousine may give off the wrong impression. By night, you're an avid drifter and need a competitive yet discreet car to smoke the competition without being recognised. There are no practical concerns at all and no budget, so feel free to explore tuning possibilities. Yes, baby. Um, I'm going to go first with uh, Edward Lovett. So last week, I talked about the Toyota Century, but obviously now we're shopping in 1995. But So I'm going to go back to 1995 and I'm going to buy a Toyota Century. I think that's the right low key car for an executive banker to be driven around Okio in. B12? B12. And then my drift car is also going to be a Toyota Century. <laughs> <laughs> and, there, and there is such a thing. There is such a thing, as you can imagine, because the uh, Japanese do like to modify. So I found a, a 1,017 brake horsepower at 9,000 oh, RPM V12 Toyota Century drift car. And I think that will be perfect. It'll, it'll match almost exactly like the road car. It'll be slightly lowered with a bit more tow to do whatever you need to do to make these things drift. I did watch a few videos this afternoon of these guys. They are... So <laughs> fucking cool. <laughs> I agree. Um, uh, Chris Cooper. Well, um, in yet more evidence that I am an agricultural rural simpleton, I had to ask what Yakuza was. <laughs> I didn't know what oh. it was. So I spoke, I spoke with... Uh, this, uh, this would have been later, earlier last week, when we started looking at this. And I said, what is Yakuza? And Cameron said, it's a bit like MS-13, Dad. What's that? Apparently that's a Colombian version of Yakuza or Sinaloan cartel. Anyway, so once I was tuned in to the vernacular, uh, I too ended up with, well, we are torn between uh, an S600 or 600 SEL, V12, uh, Der Panzerwagen, uh, or actually, I really like the idea of a Century V12 for my wafting wagon. Uh, the drifting one, though, is slightly more, um, a bit, bit more, a collector's choice. I think you'd have, because you're a successful American banker living a double life in Tokyo. You just don't care. You've gone mad. You've had more stuff through your head and your nostrils than anyone um you ju you're just living the i think you'd have a 964 turbo wound up to a million horsepower nice yeah i think it's the most difficult it'd be most difficult thing to drift yeah you'd be an american world. banker you are a master of the universe you think the world revolves around you and you think i'm not going to have one of those specially actually it's bit easier than people think to drift one of those things with the special racks and the special weighting of the corners and stuff. No, I'm going to have a 964 turbo with more lag than God. Yeah, that's, what that's I cool. I like that. Manish. I think I am terrified of the Yakuza. I don't know if you, have you seen, has anybody here seen The Predator? Yes. Where all the, all the, all the it's the one where all the assassins arrive on um, on a planet. They're all sort of dodgy. They all uh, come yeah. various ways. And you know, so that one of them is a yakuza, and there's a great line. He just picks, he holds his hand up, and you realize he's got all these fingers missing, and he's not spoken. And they go, Where are your fingers? And he goes, I talk too much. <laughs> That's it. That's why he's lost his fingers, because he talks too much. And he had said nothing. So these are scary people. And I think you, you need two cars, which are both going to be pretty incognito because you don't want to be kidnapped by the Yakuza. So I would actually get, it's 1995, going to use the A word, but I would get an Audi A8, the D2. Mm. And I'd get that with inscriptions withheld. I'd get that in a gorgeous navy blue, yeah. Very, very dark leather of some description. So not the red stuff that I mentioned last week for my Monteverdi. 
And um, I think you could be driven around in that. I'd have some curtains at the back. That's what I would do. So you couldn't see that I was an American investment banker. And people do do that in Japan. And um, to drift, I think there is only one car, and it would have to be a black Mazda RX-7, the FD3S. That is a drifting car. I had a little look at these. I'll tell you what, you've got two options with the engine. I think you either put a massive Garrett turbocharger on this twin blade rotary engine. And they, they were saying they can produce 550, 600, even more than that horsepower. It's that big. And you have to do all kinds of other bits and pieces to it. Or the alternative is to put an LS3 crate engine into that. So you can do that, put a Chevy block into it. Either of those things, this thing, it's black, just drive it down the road, no one will notice. Nice. If you turn up at night. I think my I, I can see where you're going there, but I reckon if the, if you if you dodge the the Yakuza in your uh, Audi, once they find out that you've probably put a crate engine in a, in a rotary Mazda, they'll be on. You, you they wouldn't even bother trying to sell you back to your family; they just chop you up and throw you in the river, mate. <laughs> um, uh, Neil Clifford. I, if I'm an American banker in Tokyo, I, I I'm going to risk a little bit this uh, Yakuza thing. I I want an American car. I think I miss America. I, I want a, I want a, I want a Yankee car. I want a, I want a cool Yankee thing. But then I'm I'm like I can't go too I can't go too Chevrolet in Parlery too ridiculous. Um, but. Tokyo is like living your life in a magazine. You, you've got to you've got to look cool in just one of the coolest cities in the world. You've got to be cool. So it's a tricky call. I'm going for an original Jeep Wagoneer. Yeah. You know, uh, the wood down the side. Yeah. I don't know if it doesn't really fit the description, but bollocks. I just want to be cool in Tokyo and I want to be American. I think they, the first series was the best one. They look brilliant. I'd have one of them, probably in the Navy, but the tan leather with the wood down the side, cool thing, cool dash. And then what am I having? I don't know anything about drift cars, actually. I, I, I dread to think of what it's like to go drifting. It'd be bloody awful. It'd be sick. The whole time. Um, but um, I'd, I'd get a, a little MX-5 Rocketeer. I went down yes. to... Yes. I went... Oh. I went I went down to see Bruce and Dan in between Winchester and Basingstoke. What an amazing bunch. Um, they'd make you the just the coolest full-on carbon fiber, little MX5. You'd you'd you you would not people wouldn't know it until they heard it with those amazing carbon fiber intakes. You got a V6 engine in it, it's fantastic. You'd rear wheel drive, which you probably do need on a on a drift car, not as if I know really, but you need so, a lot, a spool diff. Sounds brilliant. Bruce would make it for you totally personally, and it'd be lovely. And that's what I'd have. Brilliant. Yeah, I like some of that. So yeah. I'm a bit torn by this. I thought the American thing as well. Hmm. But nothing's going to shout kidnap me more than driving around an American car in Tokyo in 95, is it? I mean, you might as well just walk around with a dollar bill sign on your forehead. So yeah. I'm thinking... You, you don't want to hide the fact if you go too far the other way, you're trying too hard and they'll work it out. Yeah. A well, wealthy Japanese businessman had a penchant for European cars back then. We know they did, but not going too far. I think Manish is onto something there, but I, I, I'd go small. I go smaller than them because in Japan, they really seem to recognize the length of the wheelbase. You had two inches of the wheelbase. Suddenly you're, you're more, you're more plutocratic, aren't you? So I think, I, I, I think five series is the size. So I'm going five series, but I'm going to have an E34 M5, all right? But I'm going to de I'm going to rebadge it as a 525i. Ah, ah. And, I'm going to, and I'm going to have it configured with that weird massive armrest in the middle. So it's actually like <laughs> yeah. a limousine in the back with a big bob in the middle. So I've got somewhere for my elbow, and I'm going to have curtains. Um, I'm, and I'm going to worry about the wheels, and I think the wheels might give it away to some people, but I don't think there are many Yakuza that are as sad as BMWs as me. Drifting. Back then, I think you have to have an A86, wouldn't you? That's the, that's the staple drift car. It is, yeah. They are just the most incredible vehicles. They are, that's the Mark II Escort of, of Japanese. Corolla, rear-wheel drive Corolla. Yeah, they're just an amazing car. Um, the engine is effectively a, a BD, isn't it? It's just their yeah. version of BD. What, what makes 
what is the combo that makes a perfect drift car? I think you've got you've got a longitudinal engine, four cylinder car that is unitary body with a rear wheel drive axle that's probably a live axle at the back. So that's the, that's how it started out. So you could just beast them forever. They've become much more sophisticated now, but the A you can argue that without the AE eighty six there would be no drift scene. It's yeah. that important. It's a bit like the Mark II has the same power over gravel rallying. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. So I'd yeah. have, I think it would have to be one of those. But I think, do you know what? All of us, all of us, despite thinking we're clever, we would end up shanked. We're not, they, that we'd end up in trouble. There's not one of us that would escape there. Not one. Yeah. No, that's true. Way to go, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do a little bit of music. Uh, this week, I'm going to go first. I don't think anyone else is going to nick this, but so last week when we recorded that, oh, it feels like days ago, um, I, I, I into female artists. So uh, I, I think of another voice, that. another voice that I, a female voice that I find captivating because it's so potent. This is this is the big block V8 of voices for me from the eighties. That's Alison Moye. Oh. God, she can belt a tune out. Go and listen to "Week in the Presence of Beauty" now. Oh. Your, on on your car hi fi. It's a proper tune. She has got some lungs. Go, yeah. Alison. That's for me. Okay, manage. She's six feet tall, you know that? Yeah, she, God, she can sing. Go on. Yeah. yeah no, I just noticed that um, Chris Cooper's wearing the same shirt as he was last week. I've got seven of these. Very oh. embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's seven actually seven. the Challenge Consulting uniform. They all have to wear them. Yeah. Right. Uh, manage your music. For the second week in a row, I'm going non-classical. And I. this is the piece of music I would drift to. And it's Lenny Kravitz. Are you going to go my way? You could That's really good song, man. drift yeah. that Very way. good tune. Right. Uh, Edward Lovett. Um, I have, I've been hunting for something that's Japanesey. So uh, I've gone <laughs> for Tokyo uh, by the Wombats. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. I've heard that in a long time. Yeah. Uh, Neil Clifford. Whatever. I've been listening to some of my son's um, current music, trying to make sure that I don't become an old fart of a dad, which is always very Never. easy to bloody do, isn't it? And he introduced me to a, a guy called um, Lil Yakti, L-I-L-Y-A-C-T-Y. And a new album, the, the first song called The Black Seminole. And it's really good. It's like Pink Floyd. I'm like magic. And then we we spent an hour talking about modern and old and how music is just all cool, both old and new. So yeah, stick that on. It's good. I'll listen to that tomorrow when I get up very early. It's good. It's good. Yeah. That's good. Alison Moy is a really good one. She's kind of the Adele of her time without... She was, yeah. Mowgli. She's better. She's miles better. Uh, Adele's she's better. good. You can't criticise. I'm not saying, I'm not saying she's bad, but uh, Alison Moy for me is the one. Amazing, I agree. Yeah. So, cool. like Edward, I've tried to go a bit Japanesey, and there is nothing more Japanesey than the vapours turning Japanese. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. Just ask him what, what it means. One of us had it. to do. One of us had to do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, that is the end of episode 50 of the Collecting Addicts podcast, which was recorded in nowhere near the same time as episode 49. Uh, we look forward to having you join us for episode 51 next week. Thank you very much for tuning in.